Welcome to In the News for February the 4th, 2022. I am Brett Burney from AppsInLaw.com. I am Jeff Richardson from iPhone JD. Good morning, Brett. Good morning, Jeff. And might I say congratulations on being on the Automators podcast. I started listening to it. I think I've got it maybe about a quarter uh, or halfway through already, and it's just fantastic. Uh, you wrote a little blog post about this. This is a podcast from David Sparks and uh, Rosemary Orchard, and it was just great to see you and hear you guys talk about how you automate your uh, daily life, I guess, but more so with a focus on sort of iPad and the iPhone. Yeah, it was really fun. It was lots of stuff. You know, there are some things that I've mentioned briefly on this podcast that we went a lot deeper on in the right, Automators right. episode. And then there's some things I've never talked about before that we went into. What I loved about it is that David and Rose, just they know this stuff so well. They are so, and Rosemary is a, is a programmer. That's what she does. So like they they know how to do things that are way beyond what I normally think of. And right. so it was fun for me to say, well, I automate a task by doing X. And then Rosemary's like, oh, well, you know, you could also do Y and Z. And I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. So, which is why I enjoy Enjoy listening to that podcast, even though yes. sometimes they talk about things that are a little bit more sophisticated than I would ever do. You know, yes. when you hear about somebody talking about something up here, you may just pick up the bottom things, but that still makes your life better. So that's a great podcast. And I really enjoyed being on the episode. You were you were fantastic. And I think one of my favorite parts is the title of it. <laughs> <laughs> legal nerdness with jeff richardson uh, yeah. and i just think that's great I, I remember at the beginning david says he's he's had a rule that you can only have he only wants to have one lawyer at a time on his podcast uh and then you your comment was well it's a good thing that that david hung up his shingle uh, a couple of months ago <laughs> that's right uh, he he is a lawyer he's been a lawyer for many 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 years but recently he has uh kind of uh given all of his clients over to other folks and he's focused more on just general uh apple nerdiness and i mean he's really been prolific this past month on his blog post max barkey which both of us uh really like quite a bit so uh congratulations for being a guest on that and and uh, we'll have a link for folks to go and listen to us the automators podcast with david sparks rosemary orchard and legal nerdness <laughs> with Jeff Richardson. Okay, so from that from that fun, let's talk about some some serious things. You had a couple of links that uh, in your in the news post this week, Jeff, that in my mind kind of spiraled out a little bit more to some additional touched upon some additional type stories. Uh, the main thing that I think that you were uh, talking about was a story about the app. The Apple's app transparency tracker. Is that right? Or the Apple right. tracker transparency? Yes. <laughs> it's ATT for short, not ATT and not ATNT. It's ATT, Apple transparency tracker. Yeah. It, and those initials always confuse me as well. But this is the feature <laughs> that we all saw, you know, every iPhone user started to see last year where when you right. have an app, you know, the app would ask you, is it okay if I track your location and share it with others? And yeah, I sort of laugh at that because instinctively, most people are going to say, no, it's not okay for you to track Who would me. say yes and, to that? Like, who would say yes to it? <laughs> and yet the irony is, you know, and it's like, oh, that's an unfair question. No, it's not an unfair question because that's, that's literally what it is. And, you know, you know what? so what's happened is Facebook made so much of the revenue, not only from Facebook's yes. own app, but from other apps that Facebook would pay money to. And those apps would share information about you with another app, with another app, and Facebook would put it all together. And they would be able to come up with a pretty good profile. You know, Jeff Richardson lives in New yes. Orleans. He likes this. He he does this. Right. He spends his time doing this. And they could sell that to advertisers. That's how they made their money. And so as a result of people saying no, when Apple actually asked the question of, do you want to do this? Uh, right. Facebook has announced this week that they are losing, what was it? You know, $10 billion of revenue Insane in 2022. Insane amounts of money. And right. then their market cap, which I guess is what the number of shares times uh, the share price times the number of outstanding shares, it dropped by, you know, just a, it was the biggest share drop ever. Was it 100 billion or something like that? Yeah. It's, yeah. you know, Facebook has seriously been hit. They have put so many of their eggs in the selling information about you basket Advertising that basket, when, right. you know, the, one of the biggest companies out there for smartphones, Apple, once they actually give the users some control over it. It, it seriously breaks into Facebook's business. So it's fascinating that we all knew when Apple changed this last year that it would affect companies like Facebook and, and right. especially Facebook. Right. 
Right. And now when Facebook had their earnings call this week, much like uh, Apple did last week, when Facebook had their earnings call on Wednesday, they disclosed, yeah, this had a big thing. And it's funny, I'll say one more thing about it. The, the, the tone from what I've seen from the statements from the call is that Facebook was sort of like, oh, you know, this is unfair that, you know, Apple right. is doing this. It's having such, right. and my thinking on that is, uh, and I know I'm biased because I tend to be a fan of Apple stuff, but um don't, you know, change your business, you know, adjust your business model accordingly. You know, when you're saying, you know, oh, poor us, we have built this business over, you know, tracking wherever you go and selling it to other people. I'm like, well, then maybe that's not exactly how you should be making all of your money for goodness sakes. So um, yeah. anyway, yeah. but it's an interesting story that has implications throughout the industry. Well, let's, let's just take a quick moment, if it's okay to take a step back, because when I saw the story that you linked to today, I had to myself do just a little bit of a, of a, of a primer on understanding sort of what's going on. This was a great article by Jason Cross in, in Macworld that I found just generally ex- describing what app tracking transparency is, which has been around, I guess, for almost a year, right? Maybe not mm-hmm. quite a year. This came in iOS 14.5, and we're now, you know, 15.4 or whatever that the latest this one is now. But this is something that Apple had been talking about a little bit. They promised it, I think, back in the summer of 2020, maybe, maybe even mm-hmm. 2019, uh, that they were going to include this app tracking transparency, ATT for short. So when this came out, this required now that if certain apps were tracking I, I think it was various things, but I, I know the one thing that people were, were really upset about is that each iPhone or iPad has a specific ID for that Correct. device, right? Specific number, and so, right. Right. And so that this app tracking transparency would allow you to say, no, I don't want this app to track this specific ID for my device. And similar to what you were saying, who would say, you know, if you were asked that question, do you want somebody to track you or not? Who's going to say yes? I mean, mm-hmm. I guess maybe somebody would say, I don't care. Here's a great picture in this Macworld article about Nextdoor. You know, we always think about Facebook, but, you know, other apps, a lot of social media apps will, will do this and say, allow Nextdoor to track your activity across other companies' apps and websites. You can say allow, or you can say ask app not to track. Now, you can do this on a, on a, on an app by app basis, right, Jeff? Or if you go into the settings of your iPhone or your iPad, I think it's under the privacy section, there is a tracking section under there and you can, there's a toggle there that you can turn it all off. I think that it is. If you turn it into green, then each app will ask you if it can track and if you turn it off completely, uh, because frankly, I haven't gotten a lot of these requests because I think I did turn that off almost immediately when I saw this. I don't want any apps to track me across yeah. different apps and I just turned it off for everything. So you can do that. You can do it app by app or you can even do it um for everything. I would suspect you and I talk about this a lot that a lot of people just didn't even know it was available and they may have just left it on and maybe they just said allow because they're used to tapping allow. And so it doesn't come as a surprise now, finally getting back to your, the story you linked to today, that companies like Facebook would, would kind of uh, boohoo it a little bit to say, this is hurting us. This, this, this tracking transparency and the fact that people are turning this off now uh, they said ten billion dollar hit in their revenue. That's that's incredible. That's insane. And yeah. I'm sure, I'm positive that they're not the only app that has experienced something like this. But at, at least they're the biggest company so far that has sort of come forward and said, "Hey, what Apple is doing," which I think you and I would say is really kind of protecting the user in a way or giving mm-hmm. us the ability to choose. But Facebook and other companies are saying what they're what Apple is doing is hurting us. Uh, a lot. Uh, I don't know. I can see both sides to this a little bit, but um, I'm glad I, I will say this. I'm glad that Apple put that in and I'm taking full advantage of the tracking transparency and blocking any apps. Yeah. The argument for Facebook, I suppose, would be, wouldn't you want to have better ads? You know, you're going to have ads anyway. And, you know, you're not necessarily, you know, I'm not going to show you an ad about, you know, baby diapers if, you know, you are way past that stage in your life. Right. Um, So isn't it better that that Facebook knows everything about you? So it knows specifically that, you know, (laughs) Jeff likes to go to this specific store at this specific time of the day. And so I'm just going to show him ads for that. And, you know, on one level, I could see that. But, you know, the flip side is that, you know, then they're sharing all of this information about you. And, you know, the thing is, I, I think the 
what it should be is you allow it. It's it's the same concept as cookies, which we've had on the internet for a long time. Good, cookies good were designed for point. websites yes. so that when you yes. return to the website, it would say, oh, I remember you and I can keep your settings from the last time you were here. And then websites learned that they could share cookies with each other. And so website number one learns this piece about you. Website number uh-huh. two learns that piece about you. And you you put all that stuff together and in, in some cases, you can basically figure out exactly who the person is, because if you have enough of those variables, and this is the same idea, just on Correct. the phone. So, um, yeah. So yeah. it's it's uh, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out, and and what was Facebook going to do? They they presumably will come up with some <laughs> other way to, to monetize you and, and and sell your information because that's what they do. Of course, of course. Um, you mentioned, I think John Gruber. You linked to John Gruber's uh, little post about from this just from yesterday that um, not only is Facebook saying in their earnings call, I think, that they are being affected by this. But yesterday, I'm sure a lot of our listeners probably saw some headlines that Facebook stock was not doing very well. Now, I'm sure there are many various factors as to why that that happened. But it's it's just it's kind of interesting to see that if they um, uh, if they're having some trouble sort of on the revenue side, I'm not saying this is a direct result of that, but it is kind of interesting that, um, uh, the, the, you know, we're, we're seeing we're seeing some fluctuations there that maybe a lot of us would not have expected. Facebook's in a transition stage, right? Because they've changed their name of the company to Meta. Rebranded, they're, they're, right. They believe that, you know, the future is going to be these virtual reality worlds. Are they right? I don't know. We'll find out. You know, in yeah. five years, we'll look yeah. back and see if they were right. But, you know, between losing revenue in, in their ad business, which is how they make all their money, and transitioning the company, you know, I can see why that the, I mean, again, mm-hmm. to try to put reason on stock prices is a little silly because anything can affect them, you know, the wind. But, um, but you know, yeah. the fact that wait, Facebook had a big drop, I'm sure that they're going to be fine and they'll go up again <laughs> in the future. But, um, they, but it'll they, be they can recover. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So the other thing in a, in a, in a similar type of uh, posting that you had, your very last post, when you linked to a video, which I had found separately and started watching about halfway through this video as well. Renee Ritchie, who I've been following for a long, long time, is a fantastic YouTuber. But he had an interview with the head of user privacy at Apple. Now, I've only made it about halfway through, and it is a fascinating video just to kind of, you know, it, it's some, it's a, more, more high level because a lot of times these Apple executives aren't going to divulge a whole lot in there. But um, I'm glad that you linked to this because I think it is something uh, similar to what we we're just talking about with the app tracking transparency and just to just to un- to hear directly from Apple. And it, it, I even like his his title, head of user privacy, not all privacy, <laughs> head of user privacy at Apple. And I just I just know a little bit that I listen to. It's just that balance, the constant balance that they have to seek out between what you know Apple wants to do, what apps want to do, what uh, developers want to be able to do on the iPhone, and then of course what users do or do not want in some of this. So uh, that's a great video. I'm glad that you linked to that. What was interesting about the video is he points out that there are some companies that sort of add privacy at the end to a product. You know, you come up with a night with a product and then at the end you're like, oh well, yeah, I guess we should respect, you know, have at least uh, lip service towards user privacy. And so we'll, we'll add something on it to do that. Right, but right. Apple deals with it from the beginning, like in the very beginning, when they have a product that's oh, going to collect information, the first question that they ask is, you know, how much information do we need? Because if we, if we could <laughs> right. ask, if we could get 10 things about you, but we really only need two, let's just not collect the other eight because right. then there's right. no privacy inf- issue about what do we do with the other eight things. And then once we have those two, then how can we make sure that it's protected, that it's not shared? But, it, um, you know, you always wonder, because all we can see from the outside is, is somebody telling us the truth. And sometimes you believe companies and sometimes you don't. But right, Apple right. really appears to, from the beginning for each of its products, be taking privacy into account. And believe me, it's not like Apple doesn't use your information in some ways, because they obviously exactly. do. True, Apple makes a true. ton of money by from Google every year by um, right. Google, the default search engine. And right, we all know the right. reason that Google is the default search engine in Safari is because there's a certain amount of information about you they can get. So it's not like Correct. Apple is Correct. you know a perfect angel all the time, but That's they right. definitely put money and resources behind be cognizant of privacy, um, you know, which again is in sharp contrast to Facebook, who at its core is the exact opposite. The whole point of right. Facebook is to right. learn everything possible about you to sell that information. That's what the company, that's what it's all about. And it, they're just completely different types of companies. So this interview was interesting because it allows you to peek uh, behind the curtain a little bit. Right. And see right. How Apple, you know, when Apple, when Tim Cook gets up, when Tim Cook gets up on stage and says, 
we took, you know, privacy is baked into this product. You watch this video and you understand, okay, now that's, that's what he means by that. That's, that's why right. privacy right. is baked in. So, yeah. It, I also just quickly thought about while I was listening to you, how both of these companies kind of, um, uh, control the message, as it were. It's great that Apple's head of user privacy is speaking with Renee Ritchie on YouTube. And then what was it maybe three or four months ago when we had that whole blow up that somebody left Facebook, right? And all of the documents that she took with her and she was in a congressional hearing and, you know, just kind of revealing kind of how Facebook kind of looks at the privacy. I mean, I don't want to get into the whole political angle of it, of course, but it was just interesting. I remember we almost don't hear much about all of that that happened. I'm not really sure why. That was a huge story that blew up, but it's just interesting to see how both of these companies kind of drive and control uh, their message on, uh, on user privacy. Uh, very, very interesting there. Yep. Well, speaking of user privacy, another <laughs> article that you link to is going back to David Sparks. It's like we can't get away from him uh, this week. And that's OK. I, 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 I very much enjoy uh, David. But he had a post this past week on his uh, blog. Um, I just I, we happen to know he, he's a he's a huge Disneyland fan. But I remember I talked with David uh, a couple of months ago and he was excited about going to Disney World and taking his wife with him. And I think it is, is his uh, his family as well. And so he had this post where he was going to Walt Disney World, walking around, and he talked about he didn't expect to see something, and that was air tags, lots and lots of air tags, but not on items or things. He said, kids, there was lots of kids with air tags, kids with air tag necklaces, kids with air tags hanging off their clothes. He says, I saw even one little girl with an air tag connected to her shoe. And I like how you talked about this in your post as well, uh, Jeff. This is not what Apple intended air tags to do, but it's so interesting to me that this is what the world is saying. This is what air tags are going to be used for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, an air tag is, is only 25 bucks. And frankly, it may be essentially free because you may already have one that you put on your luggage as you travel to Orlando, Florida. And now that your luggage is going to be in your hotel room and you don't need to track it once it's in your hotel room, why not take that tag off the luggage and put it on the, you know, the knapsack that your kid walks around Disney World with? So it's a free little tracker. And it's not going to be as accurate and as up to date as if the kid was wearing an Apple watch, which was would be the right. preferred way for you to track yes, people. Cause right, they say right. air tags are not made for tracking kids. They're not made for tracking dogs. They're not made for yeah. tracking anything that's living and can move around. And, you know, air tags work best when an item is stationary, when you leave your briefcase at, right, you know, right. somebody else's office and that where you can say, Oh, here's where it is. When you're tracking an air tag, that's in the process of moving. It's not quite as precise, but you know what? It's not bad. And for something that costs essentially nothing. zero or maybe 25 right. bucks, if you bought an extra one just for this purpose, um, as a safety measure, you know, it's not, I, I can understand it. When you are at, a, at an amusement <laughs> park like Disney World, little kids right. get excited, they may run off somewhere. And you would hope, of Absolutely. course, that there are, you know, security people there that would find them and, and bring them to the special location for kids to find lost kids, for parents to find lost kids. But um <laughs> There's certainly some security knowing that you could just look at your Find My app and find out where your kid is. So I totally understand parents doing this, and I think it's it's a, it's an interesting use of AirTags. And you know, it's the flip side of the story we've talked about in recent weeks of AirTags being used for nefarious purposes. I know, to right? Stalk people, right. But when it comes to tracking your own kids, then you're like, that's a good purpose, and you, you it does make sense to know where they are. So, but it's interesting that at a place like Disney World, that uh, David saw them all over the place. I love it. So my crystal ball prediction air tags will eventually get down to the size of a tiny aspirin and we'll start embedding them under the skin it's like to me i mean that's that's where we're going right if they're going to be that good and it's just going to keep getting good okay that might be a little weird but uh, but you know i'm I mean, basically I see have that. that now brett because my my watch can track me wherever yes, i am and right? i have that shared with my family so my i mean my wife i trust my wife inherently but if she ever needed to find out where i was any right. time of day from right. the moment that i get up out of bed until the time that i go to bed at night um and maybe sometimes if i wear my watch to bed at night even throughout throughout the night you know she can always find out where i am i could find out where she is too you could turn that off there have been times in the past where i've gone shopping for a christmas present for my wife and uh -huh. i have specifically yes. turned okay. off the tracking just in case she happens to see that i'm in this certain you know boutique store right. on right. magazine street i don't want her to see that i'm shopping there but um but otherwise so it's it's you know we're if since it's attached to me all the time i don't need to embed the pill i mean it's already essentially there and yeah. it's up to you yeah. as to whether you use that for good or for bad but 
Well, we're not going to go away from air tags just yet because you had another story in here because we, we I remember we talked about this a few weeks ago uh, because CES happened at the beginning of January of this year. And some of the stories that you and I talked about were some uh, third party companies coming out with built in air tag or find my components in there. And this was a good story. I, it, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it because really it was it was your surprise at how 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 less or how few uh, items are even out there. I remember we talked about the Chipolo card. I think, isn't that one of the ones in here? And then, yeah, card spot. And then we talked about the Targus backpack having to find my built in, but it looks like we haven't seen just a whole lot more. I'm excited yeah. for these products to come out, but uh, yeah, uh, make more people. Let's go. Everything that's listed in this article, except for the backpack, was announced last year when Apple uh -huh. first said that third parties could do it. Now, the backpack was new at CES this year, so just about a month okay. ago. But yep, if yep, you yep. had asked me last year when Apple announced the first four uh, vendors, like one of them was, was built into a, a bicycle and one of them was built into something you can put in your wallet. Um, but if you had asked me way back then, you know, Apple's starting with four. How many do you think there's going to be like six months from now or eight months from now? I would have said, right. oh, well, more than four, Several. you know, Absolutely. not, not just one more than four. I would have right. thought there would have been dozens of people that are building it into their products for all of the reasons that we just talked about, that it's useful to hmm. be able to track something. And yet it hasn't happened. So is it because it's too complicated for third parties? Is it because it's too expensive? I mean, does Apple have some licensing requirement that if you right. include it, you right. need to pay Apple something and people don't want to do it? Is there, I don't know what it is, but I would have expected a lot more third-party items to have find my built Absolutely. into it. Absolutely. Um, maybe it's still coming. Maybe it just takes this long to develop things. Maybe later this year, we'll see a bunch of them, but um, I'm surprised. I, I thought the exact same thing. There should be more. Maybe, you know, the only other thing I can think of, Jeff, is that um, <laughs> you're, if you agree to this, you're pretty much going in bed with Apple's version of tracking, right? There are other tracking components and tile, and a lot of other uh, companies have sort of similar type of tracking systems. Um, I don't know that any of those others would be as successful, but I could imagine if that would sort of turn some folks off, like, hey, we want to wait and see if there's like a better standard. I don't think there can be right now just because of the prevalence of the iPhone more than anything else, really. And the fact that it even can work with Android devices. But yeah, I don't know. I, so I'm glad that you linked to it. And I'm glad we talked to it to that extent, because it's something that we're definitely tracking. And I would like to see more. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what the holdup is. Maybe we'll maybe somebody will know and let us know. But <laughs> yeah. it's like, you come on, earlier. let's get these. Let's get them out. You joked earlier about a, a future air tag that's the size of a pill, um, you know, and your joke was for the purpose <laughs> right. of swallowing it. But it's right. definitely true that it would not surprise me for there to be a future generation of air tag that's even smaller and thinner. And so it may get that the devices yes. themselves become so small that it becomes trivial to attach them to anything. So maybe you don't even need for it to be built into products in the future. Who knows? Um, yeah, just, yeah. Another story I saw around the web, and you linked to one of them, was something brand new that Apple uh, announced, I think this past week, right? That you could have apps in the App Store, <clears throat> but they would basically be unlisted, I think is the word that they used, but you could still get a private <laughs> secret link to send to people that they could click that would take them to the app store and to that app. But this would be an app that couldn't be found if you were searching on the app store or anything else. There's a couple of good uses for this, but this was on the verge that you linked to here. Apple adds unlisted apps to its app store. Yeah, so I mean, you could have the example I used today was you could have a company that has a specific app for its employees. The only right. people that should be using the app are the employees. And so there's no reason for that to be Correct. publicly right. available and searchable in the app store. Um, but it, it's nice that you can use the app. I mean, it's nice that you can use the app store because it's so convenient. It's also Apple doesn't allow third party app stores with, with a very small exception for developers. Right. And that gets Good point. complicated because you have to create a set up developer accounts. And so this is a nice way that, you know, the other example I thought of is if you're going to a, a seminar, you know, going to the such and such convention, conference, they could right, say, right. here's our conference app. And they don't want the conference app available for everybody on the internet. Um, but when you sign up for the conference, you get a specific link to download it and you can get the app. Correct. So this, this I think makes, makes perfect sense. I'm surprised that it's taken Apple this long to do it. But um, right. it looks like it'll be a useful feature for people, for companies that want to use apps 
for a purpose other than selling to the masses. I've used some of these apps for certain, you know, very large law firms that had like a specific app that they wanted to share. Or I can imagine at very large Fortune 500 companies or so that, yeah, they have a specific app that does a specific thing for those specific employees at the company. And before I've seen different ways that it would be like a, a parent app that you would download. And then under that parent app, the, the you know, the, the company has developed like a, a sub app, if you will. I've just seen it done different ways, but I'm glad that Apple has done this. And so it's... It's something that could be useful if you do want to have an app just for specific folks on there. Now, that's good that Apple has added this, but I'm going to guess you're going to say it's bad that Apple has discontinued something else. <laughs> bring, don't block the doc for crying out loud. This was a good little post you had here. Let me see if I can bring it up on here that uh, <laughs> you're talking about how you have used the version of the Apple doc in your office since 2008, but you link to a story that it is now unfortunately saying that Apple is <laughs> discontinuing the lightning dock. So tell us yeah. about your love for the lightning dock. Mr. I love Jeff. my little lightning dock. I mean, it's, 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 I'm holding it in my hand right now on the camera. It's a it. tiny I little thing. It. You plug your cord in the back and I like it because you just sort of plug your iPhone into it. And so my iPhone can be sitting right there on my desk and, um, and it's charging, which is something nice to have with the iPhone charge during the day. Of course. Um, and I could get the same thing nowadays from a MagSafe dock that I lay my iPhone down on. Right. I sort of like right. having the iPhone propped up because I can glance and see it. If a text message comes in, I can just see it right there on the screen. I also right. like that because the um, iPhone sits in the dock, it, it maintains that connection. It's not like a MagSafe thing where if I push some papers, it could slide off. And then little did I know that my iPhone wasn't charging for the last hour and I'm right. going to pick it up and, it, and it's dead. That would be frustrating. So I right. like that, you know, you plug it into the dock, it's going to stay there. Um, I also like that when you use a dock, it's a direct lightning cord connection. So it's going to be fast charging. In fact, my lightning cord goes into USB-C. So it's really fast lightning versus MagSafe being much slower. So for a million reasons, I find these docks really useful. And I have literally, I was surprised when I went back and looked at my old posts, including the picture you're showing now. I see. Apple has had a dock <laughs> since 2008, which was the, I mean, that was the second year of the iPhone, but it was the year that I started using my very first iPhone, the 3G. That's, so yeah, that's not even lightning. That's the no, old 30-pin 30 30 connector. 30 connector. So literally <laughs> since, you know, way back when, and it used to be that Apple molded the shape of the connector. So uh -huh, that every I year see that. Apple came out with a new iPhone model, they would have to have a new version of the dock. And they got smart over time and they made more of a universal version of it that has this lightning connector with just a, uh, um, a flat bottom so that you can uh, right. put anything on it. But um, so I, I'm really upset that Apple discontinued, uh, discontinued this product. Now, admittedly, I last purchased this one, I think, in 2015. So yeah, that's Apple, the last you know, review I bought you it. Had. Yeah, <laughs> I bought one and I've been using it for six years without paying Apple any more money for it. But um, Anyway, I think that they're really useful. They're great for having on a desk. Um, and I think it's a shame that Apple's not selling anymore. And of course, there are third parties that sell similar things. So if you want this form factor, you can find something. But the Apple one was always very simple, very clean, worked really yeah. well. Well, I do remember when they came out with this lightning one and it, like you said, it doesn't have the little beveled um, um, well so that mm -hmm. the iPhone can fit in. And I was always a little nervous that I would have to like set it on there. And how is that lightning uh, little port going to hold up the phone? But I know that but it, it does. does it very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does it very well. And then you just plug the cable into the back of that little thing. And, and it looks like this last one that you have also has an, in, uh, an earphone um, jack on there it does it so does you could, so what you could do is you could put a, a, a earphone plug in here and then you could go out to like an external speaker and so that way every time oh, you put your phone nice. in the dock you right. can be connected to the external speakers now of course nowadays people do that all wires wirelessly of course with like you know right. a home pod or something a home pod right. mini or bluetooth right. but um but it was nice to have it i mean there's space for it why not stick it on there just in case you want well, to use that function it sounds like that the time of the dock has come to an end, my friend. I'm sorry. Or maybe, uh, fact, maybe they're going to come out with a brand new dock and they just want okay, to clear okay. out the we, we can hope. Can we hold we can hope, hope, maybe? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. I, I, I think that it was kind of quiet, right? I don't remember seeing an announcement or anything about this, but it's like if you try to go and search on there, even you said that you try to search for it now and it's, not even, it. uh, it's not even available. But I suspect that you mentioned this as well. 
that they want to get rid of the lightning dock because you can go and get some kind of a wireless charger. Like this is one that Apple sells on their website from Mophie that you can just basically pop the, the phone, uh, magnetize it to that air, uh, that uh, MagSafe charger and it stands up. It does much of the same thing, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's still wireless. I think you mentioned that it's still wireless. So it's not going to be as fast as if you had an actual cable plugged into the phone. But I, I suspect this is where it's going. And really, this could even be you and I both have seen some of the rumors that Apple may be wanting to take the lightning dock out completely of the iPhone, right? Well, and that could that, be where they're going on that. That is definitely a rumor that Apple wants to have no dock at all on the phone. Right. Which, you know, no it, port, it's, right. it does seem no port, rather, it does seem to be a direction that they're headed towards. Um, you know, we had the big 30 pin connector and then the smaller one. Um, I'm, I'm very curious. I, I hear people, you know, predict on the internet, oh, Apple's going to get rid of all the ports and it's going to be nothing but MagSafe. And, you know, there's going to be some disadvantages <laughs> to that. Right. I guess it's possible. Right. It would certainly make it even more airtight. I mean, for anyone that drops an iPhone in a, you know, a bathtub or a pool or a toilet or right. something like that, right. you know, having right. it more airtight would be a good advantage. But um, so that might actually be part of the reason that they got rid of it, too. In the know, let's talk about a couple of tips. Mm -hmm. I have got a quick one for you today. Something that I did not know that must have slipped in uh, without me really knowing it. And I just discovered this this past week when I was on a phone call. So once you upgrade to iOS 15 and you are on a phone call, I've always made generous use of the little mute button. I've always loved that app, you know, the iPhone, once you're in a call, there's that mute button in the top left corner there. It's always available there. And I use that generously when I'm on the call, if I need to cough or I, you know, I, I just want to listen, but I, I got to, I want to do some typing or something, you know, I use it all the time. And in the past, it's just been more of a visual uh, signal. Like when you tap it, it kind of, I think it goes into green or it goes solid. Uh, but apparently with iOS 15 here, that when you tap on that mute button now, when you're on a phone call, there's a little chime. It's very short and very simple. I think it's like, doo -doo, but it's something noticeable. <laughs> and it just caught my mind because it, this past week when I was on a phone call, I'm like, what, what, what is that? What, what, what just happened? I, I'm not sure, you know, did I hang up on them? What happened? Uh, and then there's another different sounding chime when you unmute yourself. Uh, so I just wanted to let people be aware of that and know that that's something that, again, slipped in with iOS 15. Uh, there is a tiny chime that happens when you tap mute. And there's another little, and there are a fun little chime. There's another little chime that happens when you tap the mute button again to unmute. Uh, apparently, you can turn this off if you don't want to. The other side doesn't hear the chime. So it's not like you're telling them if you're muted or not. So it's just for your own, I guess, kind of a an audio cue that you are on mute with that little chime. I've just always been in the habit of looking down at my phone and I can see when I'm on mute, but uh, the mute and uh, unmute little chime now on your phone calls. You just answered the one question I have. So you hear it on your yeah, side, but correct. the person on the other side does not hear something to indicate that you're put on mute. So That's right. they wouldn't necessarily know that you muted your phone so that you could ask somebody something on the side or cough or yeah. whatever else. Yeah. So, the okay. only, the only difference in, he mentions it in this, this uh, article that I linked to from OSX daily is that if you're, if you know, if you're on uh, like a blue using a Bluetooth speaker or something or some other kind of a Bluetooth microphone slash speaker and you tap on the mute, they, they may be able to hear something, but if you're just on a regular phone call, especially like with, with uh, AirPods or something like that, they're not going to know. Interesting. Yeah, certainly in the day of, of Zoom calls and stuff, we're all very now familiar with the idea of putting yourself on mute <laughs> exactly. because you have 15 people on the call and you don't want all the background noise. So we're exactly. all much more cognizant of that. Great tip. Um, my tip for today is a follow up from last week. Last week, I could not think of the name of this app and I wanted to mention it today. So um, oh, the yeah. app is I called remember. Keypad and okay. what the app is used for, and then I'm going to get to why I'm talking about it today. What the app is used for is if you're sitting in front of a Mac, doesn't work on a PC, if you're sitting okay. in front of a Mac and you have the keyboard that's connected to your Mac and you want to, let's say you have your iPad or your iPhone next to you, and okay. you want to type on your iPad or iPhone using that exact same keyboard, you can do that. You start this app and it will connect to the other device. Like let's say my oh. iPad sitting next to me. And there, if I want to do respond to a text from a friend, but I'm going to use more than a few words. So it's just nicer to have a keyboard as opposed to the on-screen thing. I can use my Mac's keyboard to type over there. And then when I'm done, I just close up the app on my Mac. And now my keyboard is working with my Mac again. So I mentioned oh. it last week and I wanted to point it out again today 
today because this is similar to the feature that is coming out when the next version of the iOS comes out, iOS 15.4 and the Mac OS, Mac OS Monterey 12.3, which my guess is going to be out sometime in March of the who knows. Right, right. And so they're going to have something called universal control, which we just talked about last week, that as you move your mouse cursor over to the side of your Mac screen, Uh then you go off onto the iPad. If your iPad is on this side of it, suddenly the cursor and also your keyboard are going to work with the iPad and then you bring them back over to your Mac and now they're working your Mac again. So what I'm curious about, um, I can't wait to try universal control because it sounds useful. I know, I know. If you have both, you know, multiple dice devices in front of you, but I can also see it being triggered unintentionally. I mean, I just put my key, my cursor to the left side of the screen and I didn't really intend to start controlling another device. And lo and behold, I did. And so that's why I'm very curious about how it's going to work in practice. Is right, it something that I'm right. going to say, this really works well and I just want to use universal control or do I want to have more control over when my keyboard is working with my Mac and when my keyboard or mice are working with right. my iPad or iPhone? Right. And so keypad is, uh, it's not, it, you have to manually make the decision, but um, so it, it'll be interesting to see that this, this app, may be more useful than ever after universal control comes out, or maybe (laughs) it will no longer be necessary, but you can get the app for free for the free version of the app. So if you want to sort of get a preview of what it might be like to use your, your keyboard and your mouse um, without having to upgrade to the beta version, go ahead and get keypad on your Mac and try it out. Um, There's also a paid version for 299 that allows you to control multiple devices. And I paid for it, you know, a a while ago when I bought the app because it's nice to sometimes control my iPad and sometimes my iPhone. So, but if you're curious about this upcoming feature, go ahead and check out this app, see what you think. And then once the new operating systems come out, it will be interesting to see if it's better to do it the Apple way or if it's better to do it the way that this keypad app does it. So um, I'll, be, I'll be curious to see. I'm trying it this afternoon. But you you start off this, this was a post that you did back in April in 2021 that I actually have a mechanical keyboard, a separate mm-hmm. Bluetooth mechanical keyboard. It sounds like similar to what you use for the Logitech and Max keys. Yeah. That it has the ability to, that, you, yeah, you perfect. hit the button, yeah. Exactly. And I can switch between using it on my Mac and on using it on my iPad and my, and my iPhone. And that works great, but I have to have that specific keyboard <laughs> in order to do that. And so this sounds like it's a, a really nifty option here to be able to, to use that because I, I am constantly doing that. If, I, if, if I've got my iPad and my iPhone and I want to reply to a text message, but it's going to be a little bit longer, I will not do it on my iPhone. <laughs> I will get up my keyboard and the iPad and type the reply that way, as opposed to do it, you know, with my thumbs on the iPhone and maybe just because I'm, I'm older, I don't know, but that to me just makes it a little bit more efficient. But now I, yeah, I'm trying this this afternoon. This is great keypad and it's a free app and then you can open up in app purchase for some additional uh, functions on there. Great. But somebody I'll mentioned have- this week, Brett, that they're trying out the beta of universal control. And they said that if you take your cursor on like your primary Mac and you move it over to a second Mac or an iPad or something like that. So your cursor right. is on the side. If you then restart that secondary device, your primary Mac no longer has a cursor and no longer has a keyboard <sighs> until that secondary device turns on. Cause it's like, I don't have it anymore. Oh, I gave it to oh. that other thing over there and it's now turned off. So that's now that like sounds that. more like a bug. Hopefully Apple, yeah. but that just, that's the point that there's a lot of the, you know, I can see universal control being great yes. and I can right. also see right. it driving people crazy. Now, hopefully Apple will fix that because that, that sounds more like a bug <laughs> than a feature. <laughs> I hope so. But, uh, right. so I'm just very <laughs> curious how this would work in real life. So we'll find well, out. Well, I know, you know, uh, we are, we are anticipating universal control we saw it uh demoed back in the summer and yeah, I am, a long time ago i am confident we you and i will be talking about it quite a bit when it does uh launch so until then thanks for this week and you're in the news post and we'll talk with you next week jeff thank you good talking to you brett bye-bye everybody